How's it going guys? I'm Chris and this is Regular Guy Training. Thanks for watching. Okay, so first and foremost, I'm going to apologize for my rather lengthy absence. Um, a lot has happened uh, since my last video. Uh, post my last video, uh, we ended up teaching our Pistol 1 and 2 class and then immediately after that, I went on AT um, or annual training with uh, the unit that I'm currently with now. Yes, it was super boring and yes, it took a little while to... Um, just get through that. I didn't plan on putting up a video uh, or videos for my to cover my absence in that, and that's kind of on me. But also at the same time, uh, in addition to that, there were a lot of other things that we had to deal with, namely one with the website, which by the time I post this, it will be up. I will have a link for that in the description below. Uh, it's regularguide.training. Simple enough. In addition to that as well, um, I got married. Woo! And not too much longer after that, we figured out, uh, we, we ended up going, me and the new wife ended up going to the doctor, and she's also pregnant, so I took a time, I took some time, uh, a little hiatus, if you will, to just kind of calm down the workload and stuff before my life gets obscenely busy, uh, what with now the, the company and a new family and all that stuff, so it's, um, there's a lot going on. Okay, uh, now... With that being said, though, let's get on, let's go ahead and get on with the subject matter of this video. Now, <clears throat> I get a lot of questions about uh, rifle configuration and AR configuration and stuff like that. I get a lot of questions based on, okay, well, what do I need for X and Y and Z and different purposes and stuff like that. We're going to go over a little bit of those today. Here I have a couple of different um, configuration types for you. And uh, I'm essentially going to go from the very top to the bottom as far as my priority list and what I use as a gauge for what is important to me. Now, the first and foremost thing that I will make sure that I have, and by the way, there are several different classes of um, personal rifle. The one that we're going to touch on first is uh, personal defense, and we're going to rattle through them all. Um, the purposes that I see. Now, personal defense ranges into several different options. Uh, the first and foremost is the non-SBR type, which is what most people are going to have. Get away from me, B. Now, the non-SBR types are just the easiest to get, uh, are just to get through as far as the legalities and stuff of an SBR, yeah, it's not that difficult, but a lot of people don't like to wait, and a lot of people really don't want to pay a tax stamp um, out, out of the either principle or, um, or out of funds, right? And both of those, to me, are super valid, so let's go over the non-SBR type defense, personal defense rifle. Now, I have two different types here. I have mine and the wife's here today. Um... The uh, BCM enhanced lightweight upper with, uh, with an Anderson lower and stuff like that. Uh, regular mil spec internals and stuff. But I have this guy and I have the RWMD rifle. Uh, this is mine, obviously. And there are some mild differences between the two, but they both serve the same job. Uh, so one is a 14.5 pin and welded, and the other one is a 16 with a surefire dual port up front. Now... The first thing that I'm going to talk about here that I find the most important as far as picking up a personal defense rifle is a quality base rifle. Okay. Now, as far as building one, uh, generally speaking, a lower is a lower is a lower. Just make sure that your pins don't walk out as far as your trigger pins and stuff are concerned. Make sure that the trigger springs go into a little groove on those pins. Make sure that those pins have grooves for the trigger group and stuff like that so that it doesn't walk out, which is why any walk kits are retarded, because if you have quality kit, then it doesn't matter. Uh, quality rifle magazines, um, contract new. USGI mags run really well. Uh, I don't really give a shit what anybody says. If they're, if they're not uh, overly recycled range trash, then meaning like military range trash, then they run great. The only thing about uh, contract or metal magazines is that they have a memory. You start dropping them, and they'll start remembering where they hit, like dents and stuff like that. And then it'll eventually morph the body of the magazines. Now you also have like P mags 
and Lancers and stuff like that, and those do great, but over time, uh, just like anything else, they will break, so monitor your magazines. So a quality base rifle, quality magazines, I'm going to just assume that you have those, and I'm not going to jump into a rabbit hole of those because that's a, that's a video all by itself. Now, after you have a quality base rifle and a quality uh, set of magazines, the next thing that I'm going to look at is I need a set of quality irons on the thing because I need to be able to shoot stuff and I need to be able to zero it, okay? Now, what I use as far as a quality set of, um, of irons, I generally have a standard for those unless I have like a placeholder um, on my rifle. On, on this rifle, I, I just went straight for everything um, quality and good to go and stuff like that, so I wouldn't have to shop anymore. It was fairly expensive, but it was her Valentine's Day gift, and I don't want to screw anything up. So, uh, With that being said, I went with a set of Midwest Industries, front and rear, uh, and I usually choose between those or Troy. The reason being is that with... If I fold up a set of uh, backup irons and stuff like that, I need to be—I need to have to unlock them. I don't want to just be able to fold them down without any effort at all. Because if they snag anything, and I need—and I need to use the irons exclusively, pick a reason why this dies, right? If I need to be able to use them, I need them to be able to lock in place so I can use these as independent units that I don't have to worry about folding down or any of that stuff if it gets raked off of a body part or a object or whatever. So I like having uh, backup irons that stay folded until you unlock them and then fold them out of the way. The next thing is a quality light. Now there's a review coming on this guy. This is the newer Enforce. Uh, a lot of you guys know what my opinion is on the older Enforce lights and that is that they were trash. This seems to be a much higher quality uh, flashlight. I like it so far. Now, here's the thing, um, placement of your light, and we're still on irons and lights here, right? Placement of the light uh, for the irons is fairly important to me, because what I, don't want my, what I don't want a rig to do is to take away from itself. So, what I need to be able to have is I need to be able to have a set of blacked, up, blacked out sights that I can either line up or use a CQB trick to handle what's going on in front of me, but I also don't want my own sights to be backlit by the flashlight itself and I need it to be able to be reached easily by my own hands and I need my own hands to not get in the way of the sight setup. So you can see how this would work because it dodge because it dodges up underneath the front sight post. I can actuate the light where I need to. Um, the sight radius for this is about the same as a regular M4 so it's not a big deal to me. Uh, it isn't to her either. And we can get to that light and actuate it just fine, no problem. And I don't backlight my own uh, sights. Now, for inside a house or whatever, what, if you backlight your own sights, meaning the light is getting trapped up and you're whiting and you're basically putting white light on the rear sight here, it's not a big deal inside of a house, being honest. But if you intend to use this uh, in training classes and stuff like that, you'll find hitting stuff greater than 25, especially once you start shooting a lot and you start getting some smoke kicked in, kicking up and stuff like that that having backlit sights makes it even harder to see as you're shooting through um, the smoke and all that stuff that's kicked up. So if it's just blacked out and you just have the light trying to punch through it, it makes it much easier. So the next thing that I, that I uh, prioritize in all honesty is I prioritize comfort of um, the furniture on board. Um, with that being said to me, uh, it, furniture choice is 100% on you because what it needs to be, and this is basically my checklist for this, I need to like to use my rifle for a long time. Additionally, I, it needs to be snag free. There's a, there's a bunch of different stock systems on there with a lot of different frills and stuff on it and that'll snag up on things. Cleaner is better in my eyes. Uh, I'm starting to really dig the key mod rail and stuff like that. Um, there's also other stuff that's out there. So long as it doesn't hang up on stuff, uh, just exterior things, and so long as I can just kind of gel into the gun real easy, and that includes like pistol grips and stuff like that, it's really no big deal. It's your personal preference. Um, I do like Magpul stuff, especially their rubbery uh, grips. BCM works really good. Uh, the Lancer, I'm sorry, the B5 system stock is a really good stock. I, I've cheeked that a bunch of times, uh, and there's a lot of other really good ones too. 
Now, there are certain um, furniture companies or companies that create furniture that I personally do not like, but they're functional. Uh, like, for instance, a lot of stuff that Troy put, puts out is heavier than it should be. Uh, in my eyes, anyway, but it's not like it's un it's not like it's non-functional. And if it's a personal defense rifle for like home and self-defense and stuff like that, we're not talking about patrolling for hours and days. So I can understand why people would just throw those on their their guns and do whatever. Now, additionally, um, just where the stock ends up, your extension and all that, just mind that. Make sure that you're not um, throwing in unnecessary amounts of tension, either having the stock out too far or having the stock in too short this is this stock's really tight on every buffer tube I put it on so far which is good but as long as you don't have way too much tension in the forearm and stuff as we set up on the gun then you're good to go just figuring out where ex your extension is I like it to where uh, my support hand is the same extension on a rifle as I would have with two hands on a pistol uh, that's my personal preference. It seems to be a little more comfortable for me, and it seems to work out just fine in that regard. So that's where I like to stay as far as furniture. Now, the next thing that I use as a priority list of stuff is um, is controls. Now, a lot of times, the simple, the regular military controls that are right-handed only work just fine for me. By the way, food for thought, lefties, instead of having to snick off safeties like that or whatnot, you can essentially approach it in the same way that an AK, a right-handed AK guy will approach his uh, safety to where you're essentially sweeping it off with the palm of your hand. So, like, ambi safeties are starting to lose um, their relevancy to me more and more lately, but this is a non-ambi gun for the most part except for the charging handle. Now, four guns that are made... Um, or, that are built up or customized for um, both hands, should I say. Here's the thing about adding controls or adding ambidextrous controls or left-handed conscious controls, right? My rule for that is if you're doing it, you better be able to do it with the other side. Here's what I mean. On this particular gun, I have an, amb an ambidextrous magazine release uh, from Troy. I do like a lot of their stuff. A bad lever on here so that I can drop the bolt like so. And on um, other guns that I've had in the past, I used to also have an ambi safety on here. You can see how it's starting to lose its relevancy for me. But if I add left-handed conscious controls, I need to also be able to do all of that stuff right-handed. Okay, I chose the bad lever on this particular rifle because I can essentially do damn near the same thing if I need to drop the bolt on the right or the left-handed side. Okay. So I can do essentially the same thing there. Magazine release for, for the Troy and stuff like that, it is essentially in the same place. You see what I mean? Um, charging ambidextrous charging handles, again, same thing. Now, here's my thing on uh, charging handles, okay? And we're going to go into some stuff that I view not to be 100% uh, necessary and stuff that can be placeholders for things that you want later so long as you have your priorities in check. Now, here's the thing. Optics, right? As far as optics are concerned, um, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that optics are not more effective than iron sights. Um, anyone who does, in all honesty, is retarded. There, there's no bones about it. Optics are more effective than irons, but the reason why they're lower on my priority list is that I need this rifle to function very well and I need to manipulate it very well before I start adding performance enhancing stuff and this could include or not include ambi controls because I can run again right handed configuration or left handed configuration regardless but I, I go by what is more important and what is more likely right I need a set of sights and I need a light so that I can uh, so that if I have to I can identify a target right and then I go for controls that suit me very well, but those are much less likely to be used because if you, ex I, I mean, statistically speaking, it is astronomically rare that in a self-defense situation, people would change magazines on a pistol, much less a rifle running 28 to 30 rounds in a magazine. 
Make sense? So as far as the priorities side of the house is concerned, I need a functional rifle with a good set of irons and a good light before I need anything else. Now, performance enhancing things, we now bring in controls, like like am, like ambi buttons and switches and stuff like that. And then the next thing that I, that I consider after I'm comfortable with just manipulating the rifle, um, I then go to stuff like optics, okay? Now, the gold standard for me is the Aimpoint T1 slash T2 or the Comp M4 or the Pro or the Comp M2. Aimpoint across the board, as far as rifle mounted optics, my personal opinion, they are the best all-around optic in the world. Now, yes, they definitely have competition, and they have good competition, too. They have the Trigicon MRO, and they have, as far as I see, you have some primary arm stuff out there that seems to run really well. I am very pleased so far with the Hollow Sun optics as well. I'm currently evaluating one, and when it's ready, I'll give you guys a review on it. Uh, but the optics that I've seen the most, and that I've seen the most do extraordinarily well, uh, I'm looking at aim point all day. It takes the longest to make the dot starburst over time. They generally don't lose zero. They generally have accurate turrets for their, for, um, their elevation and windage turrets, and they still have the longest battery life of the lot so far, right? So, and the closest to the advertised battery life as well. So that that's my opinion on it. However, if I'm going to add an optic to a rifle that I'm going to use for personal defense, I am going to include a quick release because if for whatever reason this goes down, I don't want obscurity on the irons at all. It doesn't matter to me. This thing is worthless. I don't care if it was $700. I'm getting it off because, because to me, is your life worth more than $700? Yes, it is. So I plan for fail, safe, for fail safes and ultra retarded things to happen. So there you go. As far as placeholders on the gun, the US mil spec or the US GI mil spec charging handle is not an object I personally believe that you have to get rid of instantly. Uh, it goes back to the, to the statistical probability of you doing a magazine change with a rifle in self-defense. It's extraordinarily low. Additionally, the chances of you having to work your charging handle are even more low. Third, a lot of people will whine about it, but the GI charging handle is not hard to use. It is not hard to use very well. It's just annoying because it pokes and prods on people and the latch itself is kind of small. Okay, even for a left-handed guy, just come over the top and run the freaking charging handle. It really isn't that big of a deal. Okay, use the stock, brace it against your shoulder a little bit so you have the distance, and then you can run the charging handle as needed. It's no big deal. Because if we're trying to go like in order of importance as far as funds, a replacement charging handle is absolutely not required. But it's nice to have. It's something that once you have all of your ducks in a row and have all the stuff that you like, as well as the stuff that you need. So stuff you need, then stuff you like. And that is in the stuff that I like category. Okay, because even working stoppages, even in controlled environments where you know you're going to do stoppages, it's still rare to be using the charging handle on a lot of things. Now, I'm not saying that you won't, but it's not the highest on my priority list. Um... Additionally, don't buy cheap parts either that go into your upper, uh, including the upper itself. I've seen far too many uh, guns that were built from members of the League of Extraordinary Budget Gun Builders die in class. Uh, I, had, I had a particular instance where a dude bought a lot of really, really cheap GI charging handles. They were just GI style, and four of them went down in one day, in one day of class, like he bent them. So don't buy cheap crap, don't justify buying cheap crap, meaning, not even meaning cost either, I mean quality of build. Okay. If it's a GI charging handle, make sure it's a mil-spec GI charging handle. Go to like BCM, Midway, stuff like that, they'll hook you up, it's no big deal. Now, with all that being said, we have a couple of things that, in, in my mind, um, receive a lot of attention and receive a lot of backlash all at the same time. The first thing that we're going to talk about is triggers. Okay. Of these two guns, the one that I personally own has a Geisley Super 3 gun in it. Um, is there a problem with sticking a high-speed trigger in your gun? My opinion, no. Okay. There isn't a problem with that at all. I'm 100% on board with 
adding a high speed trigger into your gun uh, so long as you understand the following. If you understand that equipment is not a solution for anything, all it does is mask your shortcomings. And if you've already acquired the skills necessary to hit consistently and accurately with regular mill weight um, options and stuff like that, because to me, I would so much rather earn, um, like earn my way. So, uh, uh, yeah, essentially earn my wings per se on the uh, on the mill standard because it is indeed harder to use well. Because then I can just pick up any rifle, and as long as it's got sights and a trigger, I can make it work. No big deal, right? Now, here's another thing that I personally believe is a wash across the board. And there's a lot of discussion and a lot of debate on stuff like muzzle devices. Now, I've gotten questions on why exactly this is like my go-to rifle, especially with the huge compensator on it. Uh, and a lot of people are going to talk about how loud it is, and they're going to talk about how deaf I'm going to be. Let's be real here. You touch the trigger and send a firing pin into the primer of a, of a center-fired rifle uh, cartridge at any point inside of a house. Without ear protection on, you'll be deaf. 100% deaf. I don't care what it is. I don't care what muzzle device is on it. You're going to be deaf. Okay, even on 22s. You start to have issues hearing well if you crack off a couple of rounds inside of a house. Especially if you have like wood floors and the acoustics echo really hard. So it's going to be loud, you're going to go deaf, and if it's dark, you're going to catch flash. Now, here's the big thing that a lot of people uh, really do not like about muzzle brakes is how much flash that they produce. Now, on this particular rifle... Um, I'm not going to sit here and say that the flash isn't obnoxious. It really is. However, a 300-ish lumen light will overpower flash in a heartbeat. You will notice the flash. You will notice that it exists for sure. But the light will stay on target, and you will be able to see over the top of that and right onto your target, no issues whatsoever. Additionally, because the brake itself fans out the blast to either side, I can still see over the top of the gun um, just fine, and I've never lost, quote-unquote, my target uh, shooting in the dark with a, with a real heavy muzzle brake. All this really does is it helps you shoot faster and flatter. That's it, okay? Now, for those that choose to go away from the muzzle devices, I completely understand. I completely understand because signature is a big deal for a lot of folks. I personally, it's not a huge deal for me because the second I touch off a trigger on a rifle, the whole world knows where I'm at anyway. But for those of you that want to go middle of the road, uh, PWS makes a great one. Um, Bravo Company also makes a great one. Their gunfighter line of just add-on stuff for ARs to me is great. Um, uh, pretty much everything, for the most part, works really well. Uh, they have a really good middle of the road muzzle device slash uh, flash suppressor that gives off about as much flash as like a bird cage does, but it helps the gun um, stay a little bit flatter and the impulse is straight to the rear right where it should be. I'm not a big fan of uh, battle comp stuff. The impulse is made more violent and the muzzle rise is not dampened much more than a bird cage and it gives off way more flash. I'm not a huge fan of it. But it's stuff that we can add on to enhance the already important things. These are things that we want, right? And all I can do from there is just add my opinion, and it's all subjective and personal opinion type territory from there. So that's the home defense type setup. Um, the next thing is like your, uh, your DM type rifle. Uh, we're not exactly a bench or a target rifle yet, but we, are, but we have a setup that we want to shoot farther away with, that we want to be able to observe uh, pretty well with, and that we want to be able to pull dope and data from and all that, right? Now, a lot of you guys saw the 20-inch uh, the M16A4 clone that I built up with a full-size stock and all of that. Uh, I am a personal believer in DM rifles being fixed stock, um, fixed stock, longer-barreled guns with glass on them, uh, mostly because if the objective of this rifle is to shoot farther, then I'm going to do my best 
to accommodate that very well. I'm also going to do my very best at, with this being a DM rifle to staple myself into a position uh, when I can. And for me, the fixed stocked cylindrical handguard non bipoded guns are easier to just throw onto anything that's really uh, solid and just kind of sit there and observe slash shoot better from. I like the 20 inch guns because of the added muzzle velocity. It's not that much realistically, but it is added muzzle velocity, added um, kinetic energy, lethality, all of that stuff. And it makes it easier to shoot a little bit farther because that light bullet isn't getting tossed around real hard either. So as far as the DM guns are concerned, I understand guys that use collapsible stock guns, mostly because a lot of people aren't constructed like fun noodles. So especially guys with shorter arms, I completely understand the fixed stock variety of dudes. Um, a short list of stocks that fit that affix themselves very, very tightly, and that I like using for that specific role. Uh, Magpul in almost all of their stock variety is very tight to the tube itself. This is one of their newer MOE stocks. Uh, you can see that it takes a little bit of an influence from other stocks on the market. This guy does fit very tight to every buffer tube I put on it so far, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a problem with it. The CTR has a manual lock-in to where it locks onto uh, the buffer tube itself, and it doesn't really move or rattle or anything like that. I've seen that used on a lot of DM guns with great success. Um, the, the UBR, I get questions on it, the utility battle rifle stock, to me is entirely too heavy for its intended purpose, but it will function well. Okay, so there's that. And a lot of times I, I answer the SDM role type thing because I get a lot of mill dudes and other units that ask me little questions here and there, so I got to accommodate that little, that little nugget right there. Um, with the UBR stock, I have seen it on a couple of like uh, of deployed M4s before, and the first thing that those dudes complain about is after a few hours, you really feel the stock. So lighter options are a little bit better. There's a lot of people that complain about um, the minimalist stock. I'm going to tell you what, this is one of the tightest fitting stocks to a buffer tube I've ever seen in my entire life. There's just enough slope in, the, uh, in where you get a good cheek weld on to where I could, I would very easily use that on a distance-esque rifle and not have any problems with it whatsoever. Because the principal thing that a stock like that needs to have is it needs to have rigidity so that you're consistent with where your face goes on the gun and that you're not torquing um, the sights off of where they need to be even though you think you're not. And number two, you also need to be able to brace into it, uh, my personal opinion, or throw like a, like, a sand, like a little sandbag or a sock filled with airsoft BBs so you could control essentially where the gun tilts up and down with that little thing. And this guy actually provides that perfectly for you. So if it's real tight, I could do those things that I need to, and it's also pretty light, I'm okay with that. Um, I, I've used it in guns that I've configured for the DM role before. It's not my preferred option, but it's absolutely understandable why it is for a lot of people. It's way too bright, the sun's behind the camera, sorry. So there's that. And then we go into, oh, and as far as glass is concerned, holy crap, there's a giant variety of stuff that's out there. I'm a little bit of a pain in the ass on glass because I tend to be a glass Nazi, mostly because if I plan on doing things farther away, the value of my glass, I want to be equal to or greater than equal to the value of the rifle itself. I'm a huge fan of Trigicon products. I'm a huge fan of Loophole, Night Force. Uh, I do not have an ass load of experience with like primary arms and stuff. I know Vortex has come a long way. <coughs> not a giant fan of anything other than the Elite series from Bushnell. That type of deal. So generally speaking, I, 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 I'll admit, I judge people that bring uh, quote-unquote budget-esque glass um, and sling them onto guns that are that they want to shoot 700 and in with, which you can absolutely do with great lethality on uh, on a 5.56 AR style rifle, uh, especially depending on what ammunition you use. Uh, and ammunition, being ammunition conscious is also a big deal as well. You want heavier stuff. Uh, I like 1 in 7 twist, but I also like 1 in 8 two, two, three wild because it handles the balance of good ammo and bad ammo all, all together. Uh, I believe that's the future of AR barrels, and I wish that we would just go there. Uh, but 
whether it's uh, 18223 wild or 17. Uh, I like them both because they can both accommodate what is, in my opinion, the best 5.56 millimeter round uh, for anything, period, for the most part, and that is the uh, 77 grain Mark 262 um, uh, or Mark 262 spec 5.56 rifle round. Um, I find that to just be the best overall as far as ballistics performance, crushed hair, all that stuff. And it does very well at any range, So, and you can get it readily. Uh, there's a lot of different people that run a lot of, different, that run a lot of the same SAMI spec on it. The most notable is uh, Black Hills. You can load your own specs to it yourself because it's not like the, the SAMI spec for it is a secret. So um, I personally prefer that if we're working any real distance work. Other than that, zero to four hundred, pretty much like all the treat, the, all the cheap crap you can run out to that distance. It's just better ammo, uh, better performance on, you know, breathing stuff. If we're just trying to kill cardboard and hit steel, whatever. But mind your ammo choice if it's for, you know, living, breathing things. So there's that, and then you have the target rifles or the precision rifles. <sighs> I'm going to be the one that says that I do not like the AR rifle for precision rifles. Now, I know I just made a lot of PRS and CMP dudes really, really angry. But generally speaking, if you ask the same people, if I could only build one rifle, would I build a gas gun in the AR type, in the AR type uh, arena? Or would I build a bolt rifle um, with the same caliber if I'm doing precision work? And other than what type of match am I shooting, generally, sp uh, generally speaking, a lot of those guys would just be like, yes. Because the gas gun deal for precision work, you lose the speed advantage the farther back you go because you still have to be calm and go through all of your precision rifle fundamentals and stuff like that if you're going to hit stuff farther away, which will slow you down uh, invariably. But if we're going to go down that route... Generally speaking, I can't help you. Here's why. I don't delve into this very much because if I'm going that route, I'm picking a different caliber. I'm, I'm picking a bolt gun, and there's just a lot of different other factors that go into that. Way better glass, all types of other stuff. So um, I'm not going to travel down that rabbit hole because it takes a long time to go through. And if me just talking about a theoretical rifle that I would build that I don't care for, um, it's, it's a wash. The only thing that I would say that I would just default to, because I have used it before, and it's very good with like Mar 262 type stuff, and it holds sub minute for days, is a Mark 12 series uh, rifle. Uh, and this is where I become a stickler on this too, because I don't want to be the guy that has to make sure that all the tolerances are good. I don't want to build fence or something like that and get a Mark 12 type rifle. So there you go. So essentially, I mean, that's it, really. Um, there are some things, I need to move this stuff out of the way. There are some things that are little outliers to this, like you have um, your short barreled rifles, which I, didn't, which I didn't touch too terribly on. Generally speaking, if we're going to go shorter than a carbine length gas system on those, and like a ten and a half inch barrel, I would highly suggest like 300 blackout because that's awesome for that, especially if you, throw a can, if you throw a can on it. God, those can get really short and be super effective. But if it's in the 5.56 five, realm, I tend to just kind of stay in 10, 5, 12 and a half inch barrel uh, area with a carbine lathe gas system, mostly for reliability issues. Uh, even though I know I'll be changing parts out a little more frequently, like I have a Mark 18 style 12 and a half inch barreled rifle that started life as a pistol and all this other stuff. And I'm certain that I'm going to kill the barrel on that very soon. Because uh, we're venturing into the uh, 15 and a half thousand round range. But um, essentially that's where that is. And the cool advantages of short barreled rifles is that in a house, they're per, for personal defense and stuff like that. Their um, issues as far as effectiveness at greater ranges are completely awash. They just, ha they just happen to be a little bit louder. But their maneuverability and stuff like that is just awesome. So if I were to, you know, pick an individual rifle, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I need something that I can fill as many roles as I can as a, quote, jack-of-all-trades rifle. 
and that's going to be something like this, uh, one and eight uh, twist, two, two, three wild, um, chambered, uh, 16 inch barreled rifle uh, with a good old compensator on it, a bunch of cool controls and stuff like that that I personally like. And that's only because I, I can shoot fast with it, I can shoot flat with it, and I can shoot far away if I throw on another piece of glass, whatever. You know? So uh, that's really my perspective on it. I'd love to hear uh, your configurations for your rifles and stuff like that because you guys uh, tend to do a lot of cool... Um, they, you guys tend to have a lot of cool little insights that makes me rethink things just a little bit every once in a while. Uh, and, in, and in addition, I'm going to apologize yet again. Um, I know that this whole thing started as a YouTube channel, but you guys had to take the back seat for a lot of other things that are happening in my life. So, unfortunately, that's how the ball rolls. But if you want to just go, if you want to go ahead and join our discussion page on Facebook, I'll leave the link to that in the in the description below. Um, that's got a lot of people on it with a lot of good stuff, a lot of good questions get thrown up, and we have a good admin staff that can answer a lot of different questions. These guys are on are on their shit. And if you guys want to support us through Patreon and stuff, um, we do a lot of cool things with the money that you guys provide. For instance, like any time that I have a class, I bring in a soldier from uh, my previous unit, and we give them free training that includes, you know, free flight, ammo, uh, if I have to, guns, gear, that type of stuff, so they can come out here and, and train with us. And uh, yet again, uh, by the time that this video goes up, there's going the link for the um, for the school is going to be in the description below also and we're going to have upcoming classes please be a little patient because I'm going to have the September dates uh, posted first I have to base my schedule of the company around military stuff uh, as far as the reserve uh, component is concerned and our fiscal year starts in October so until I get that drill schedule we're going to have the September classes posted but once I do that I'm going to end up posting Many more other classes uh, throughout uh, these upcoming months, and our fall and winter months are going to be really heavy, because as you can see, behind me is farmland and stuff like that, and once they're done with harvest and stuff like that, um, there's going to be a lot more capability for us to do things and to work more. So I, I do appreciate the patience and all that other stuff from a lot of guys who've been waiting on the website and beating me to death on the website and stuff like that. But... All of this is panning out to where it needs to be, so we'll see how that uh, swings out, all right? So, thank you guys for everything. I, I appreciate everything that you guys do. You guys are the lifeblood of this whole thing, and without you, obviously, none of this would be um, even close to what it is today, so I appreciate that, and thanks a lot. Uh, more to come soon. A lot, of guns to, a lot of guns and gear to do reviews on, so stay tuned, and remember... A regular guy's firearm is the last defense against tyranny. Be easy.